In the previous lecture, we talked about how mixed results are likely to happen. Sometimes you can read the scientific literature and you can find conflicting findings. It's useful to be able to integrate these and to evaluate differences between sets of studies. We can do so through meta-analysis. In some way, if you design and report a study, in the ideal case, it's actually a single data point in a future meta-analysis. Both statistically and philosophically, performing close replications is essential for science. Statistically speaking, because there are always error rates, there's always variation, so repeating a study multiple times gives us a much more reliable estimate of true effects. And philosophically, it's also the same. We like other labs to replicate our studies because there might be unknown small variations and it's a way to show that results are intersubjectively testable. Other people can find the same thing. So if we have these sets of studies, it's a good idea to actually look at the totality of the evidence. We can use a meta-analysis for this. It can be used to combine either raw effects if all of the studies have exactly the same dependent variable, you can just pull them all together. Or if all of the studies use slightly different ways to measure something, then we can use standardized effects. And a meta-analysis can be performed on both of these, the raw effects or standardized effects. Let's first think of the question that a meta-analysis actually answers. Very often people treat it as if it gives the final answer. Is there a true effect in the literature, yes or no? But in practice, it's hardly this simple. You can even question whether we should think about something as there being a single effect. There are very often in a meta-analysis variations in how we studied something, and these will lead to small variations in the effect size. You can argue that one of the more interesting things to do is actually to ask, what sources of variations are there in these sets of studies? And can we theoretically explain them? Or if not, can we develop theoretical ideas that might explain them in the future? So instead of thinking of a meta-analysis as giving a yes or a no answer, it's more an interesting tool to explore variation across studies and to evaluate patterns. The ideal meta-analysis is probably known as a prospective meta-analysis. In a prospective meta-analysis, we find studies that are eligible for the meta-analysis before the results in any of these studies are known. In medicine, this is sometimes done as a multi-trial center. There are multiple universities, across the world maybe, who study the same research question in their own patients, People work together and actually already know that after a certain period of time, the real answer will come from combination of all these smaller studies that are being performed. So we are performing a meta-analysis based on studies that we know will happen. And the nice thing about this is that if we have identified all these studies, there is no bias. We know the entire set of studies that are being performed. So prospective meta-analysis is maybe an ideal case. Very often, however, we perform meta-analysis on the scientific literature. And in these cases, we do need to think about publication bias or other sources of bias in the sets of studies that we can find. If you have identified all the studies that you want to include in your meta-analysis, then for each effect, you have to calculate the effect size estimate and its variance. And this is actually all you need to perform the meta-analysis itself. However, as you go through the literature, it's also advisable to code variables that might explain variation across studies. You might think about the country in which study was performed or the type of manipulation that was used in an experiment. Calculating the effect size and its variance is actually relatively straightforward. If enough data is presented in the original articles, which is regrettably not always the case. For this reason, making raw data available is very recommended because it will make future meta-analyses much easier. If all the data that you need to calculate the effect size is available, such as means and standard deviations, and for within designs, correlations between dependent variables, 
you can quite easily calculate the effect size and the variance. And this is all you need. Now, I realized that performing a meta-analysis itself is not actually as difficult as I always thought. I remember that I once talked to somebody who publishes quite a lot of meta-analysis and helps other people to perform meta-analysis. And I said, yeah, it's actually much less difficult than I thought. And she said, yes, shh, don't tell anyone because now they actually ask me for help. Now, there are a lot of complexities in doing a meta-analysis, in coding everything accurately, and also in accounting for things like bias. So it's not that a meta-analysis in itself is extremely easy to do. There are definitely some difficulties. But it's easy enough to try to do this if you start with a new research line, as you're reading the literature anyway, to also code the effects and the effect sizes and the sample sizes of the studies you're reading, so that you can also have a more quantitative evaluation of all the evidence. A very good introduction to meta-analysis is a book by Borenstein and colleagues. Now, I'm not paid to advertise this, but I think this is really an example of how statisticians can write a book that is extremely useful and accessible, so I'm happy to recommend it if you want to think about doing a meta-analysis yourself. When you perform a meta-analysis, you have to specify the meta-analytic model. You can either assume that all of the studies are generated by the same effect. There is a fixed effect underlying all of the effects that you're coding in the literature. Very often this is not a reasonable assumption. We are not doing identical, almost simulation-like studies in some reality where everything is the same across studies. There are always minor variations and as a consequence, it very often makes more sense to perform a random effects model where we also model some variation across studies due to tiny differences in manipulations or tasks or context in which a study is performed. If we then perform this random effect meta-analysis, this is an example of studies you might find. This is known as a forest plot. It means that we see tiny different lines and altogether they give an overview of the evidence. Here every line is a single study because in a meta-analysis we are doing a study over studies. So every data point is an individual study. We have an effect size which is indicated by a square and we see the confidence interval around the effect size. We also see the effect size scale on the bottom and we can already see whether single studies include zero. Their confidence interval is overlapping with zero, which means that they would not be statistically significant by themselves. Way at the bottom, we see next to the random effects model that there is something that should be a diamond, slightly low resolution diamond, but nevertheless. And the center of the diamond indicates the observed meta-analytic effect size and the sides of the diamond indicate the width of the meta-analytic confidence interval. And here we see quite some variation across studies. Some are significant, some are not. Some show larger effects, some show smaller effects. But if we look at the meta-analytic effect size, we can clearly see that overall something is going on. We have good reason to reject the null hypothesis. Now, as we perform lines of studies, again, we should always keep in mind that it's possible that we find mixed results. Sometimes you might be lucky and you find a couple of significant results early on in the research line. It could also be that you do the first two studies and you find something that looks like this. The first study shows an effect size of 0.3, which might be a standardized mean difference. The second study shows an effect size of 0.23. Now, each of these individual studies are not statistically significant. You would find p-values that are larger than your alpha level. We can see this because the 95% confidence interval overlaps with zero. So neither of these studies is statistically significant in itself. So it makes sense to think about this in advance and prepare for this, because if you would pull these studies together in an internal meta-analysis, you have a much more reliable estimate of the overall effect size, and you might be able to see that something is going on, even though the individual studies are not statistically significant. So this is clearly one of the strengths of performing a meta-analysis. 
Now, I want to stress that the strength of meta-analyses is not to turn non-significant individual studies in a statistically significant meta-analytic effect. Using meta-analysis in such a way can actually be a questionable research practice in itself. What I'm saying is that a strength of meta-analyses is that you can pull studies together and in this way get a more accurate overview of the evidence that is available in the set of studies. Now, don't expect statistically significant effects in each study that you perform. This should be clear by now. Try to perform close replication and extension studies so that you can integrate them and perform a meta-analysis at the end of your paper if you want to. And make sure that you report all the data that you collect in case someone else in the future wants to perform a meta-analysis on your data. I think that one of the most interesting questions to ask in a meta-analysis is whether you can explain the amount of heterogeneity or the variation that you see across effect sizes in studies in the meta-analysis. Do you have a theoretical model that maybe actually predicts some differences in effect sizes? And if not, can you create a model that you can test in future studies that is inspired by the observed differences in effect sizes in the meta-analysis that you performed. People very often ask, is there an effect or is there no effect from a meta-analysis? But this is not as exciting as you might think, especially not if we ask this question based on studies in a published literature that we know is biased. Explaining heterogeneity is, I think, a really underappreciated but very important and useful goal of meta-analyses. And I think it deserves more attention. When you perform a meta-analysis, consider the quality of individual studies. In my field, psychology, we don't really do this if we perform a meta-analysis. But this is more common in other fields, such as medicine. When we perform a meta-analysis, we weigh the effect sizes that were observed in each individual study by the sample size. We don't just calculate an average over all the studies that are performed, but we give more weight to larger studies because these effect sizes are more accurate. So in other fields, they use quality as another way to weigh each individual study. If we think a study is very low quality, we want our effect size estimate in the meta-analysis to be less influenced by this particular data point. A good meta-analysis should also always evaluate the presence of bias. We'll talk more about how to detect things like publication bias in the next lecture. If you perform a meta-analysis, it makes sense to do this using reproducible workflows. Instead of using very non-transparent commercial software that might not even allow you to export the underlying data that you calculate or the code that you use, consider using open source packages such as Metaphor in R. I think the Metaphor package is in itself already a reason to learn R if you're ever planning to perform a meta-analysis. It is a state-of-the-art free software package that you can just use and make sure that someone else can actually reproduce the meta-analysis that you performed. Also take into account that there are available checklists and guides on what to report if you perform and publish a meta-analysis. People are not very good in making sure that the quality of a meta-analysis is state-of-the-art. Checklists such as the Prisma checklist, and a new one is going to come out very soon, so look for updates to the 2009 version. These checklists give you a guide of what to consider, what to keep in mind, and what to report if you perform a meta-analysis. It makes sense to recruit expertise. When you perform your first meta-analysis, there's a lot of stuff you probably don't know. And we see, regrettably, quite a lot of meta-analyses that make mistakes or don't reach the levels that they could if they had recruited expertise at the right moment. So if you're performing your first meta-analysis, by all means, ask other people to help and guide you to do the best you can. One source of information you might not consider is going to your library, for example, to help out with the literature search. 
There are people here, information specialists, who really know what they're doing and can help you to search the scientific literature for your meta-analysis. You can also pre-register your analysis plan. Take a look at the Prospero database and how this could be done. This makes it possible to be more transparent about what you plan to do as you started on your meta-analysis. Now, during the meta-analysis, you might want to update these pre-existing plans. Very often, you discover new things. So instead of a pre-registration that is completely fixed, you should see this more as an open notebook, where you keep track of how your thoughts developed throughout the process so that you can provide a transparent overview of all the thoughts and decisions that you made along the way. A Dutch science journalist, Job de Vrieser, wrote a very nice overview of how meta-analysis were originally sort of thought to give clear yes or no answers about what's going on in the scientific literature, but how it turns out that very often they just start debates. A good example is literature on video games and aggression, a field that has been doing many meta-analyses and different sites simply don't agree on what's actually going on. So this illustrates that a meta-analysis should not be seen as a tool that provides some sort of definite answer, but more as a tool that allows us to evaluate and discuss the evidence that is in the literature and to guide future research based on the information that we find. A meta-analysis might be able to yield reliable effect size estimates. This is clearly true in a prospective meta-analysis, but it is more problematic if you perform a meta-analysis on the published literature, as we'll see in the next lecture. More importantly, they allow you to explore theoretically interesting variation between studies. And this is a very good way to use a meta-analysis, especially if you're starting on a new research line.